is what we'll start. Uh, now, any of you that may uh, not know much about the scriptures, uh, let me give you some background. The book of Acts is written by a brother by the name of Luke. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor uh, that was also attributed with writing the gospel according to Luke. All right. So the same author has written the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And if you look at uh, the way Luke describes who he's writing to, he's writing to a very prominent Greek person at the time by the name of Dionysius. No, I'm sorry, Theophilus. Dionysius was a slave. Or something. Um, he's somebody in the Bible, Dionysius. But this person is Theophilus. And Theophilus is a very prominent person at the time, and Luke was attempting, according to Luke, his own self-purpose and description in the text. He says, I want to give you the most excellent account of the gospel of Jesus. Man, Luke was trying to make sure that he was presenting to the readers the most excellent account. He took very uh, care to interview all of the eyewitnesses, people like Peter, People uh, who were uh, there with Jesus. He poured over the other manuscripts of the book of uh, Matthew and Mark. And he pulled those overlapping kinds of stories. And he, he put them all in his gospel. And, and one of the themes of this gospel is to make sure that everyone understood that Jesus was relevant for them. Man, Jesus was relevant for them. That Jesus was not just for the Jews or not just for the pagans or for the Greeks or the Romans, uh, for the Africans or the Asians, but Jesus was for everyone. All right. That's a major theme in the writings of Luke. The universality of the gospel. It applies and impacts all of us. All right. yeah. That's a good thing to know, amen? That we have that in common. This common gospel story. In this regard, uh, as Luke begins to uh, write the book of Acts, Luke then uh, moves from the eyewitness testimony of the people who saw the life of Jesus to now being able to describe in the book of Acts what did they do with the, this experience that they had with Jesus. How many of you know that sometimes we can hear a lot about Jesus but we also need to do something with what we've heard. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the early church, uh, the early followers of Jesus, they heard this gospel message, and the book of Acts begins to record how the disciples went out into the world and spread this message. And it is in this way we pick up in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, uh, at verse number 41. The day of Pentecost has just happened, and I'll preach on that on June 8th, the Pentecost Sunday. But Peter has just uh, done a whole bunch of good preaching, and this is the response that Peter gets at the end of his preaching. This is the dream response of every preacher in the history of gospel preaching. Verse number 41, it says, that day about 3,000 people took Peter at his word. Amen. I mean, we, I mean, every preacher just wants that. Amen. Even if you only got 100 people in church, we all want 3,000 people. Amen. Just to take us out of our work. We want people to grow. Amen. In the chairs. Amen. Just come and say yes to God. They were baptized. They were signed up. And they committed themselves to the teachings of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Verse 43 says, and all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. I tell you, that don't sound like capitalism to me. Amen. I don't know. Amen. 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 Some of these folks didn't even run for office in some of our places. Amen. The way folks throw that socialist word around. Somebody say amen. Amen. Oh, uh, well, that's the top of the day. Verse 46 says, They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, and every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful. 
as they praised God together. People in general liked what they saw every day. Their numbers grew as God added those who were saved. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So, we're going to spend the next few moments uh, kicking off a six-week series through our 40 days of community. We're going to stay in this passage for the next six weeks and pull out some very key texts and themes. But today's sermon will be entitled, We've Got Something in Common. We've Got Something in Common. Father, bless the word of God that is read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you and send your anointing. That means preaching and teaching easy that rest upon me. Be the hearers of this word in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, we've got so much in common. Come on, tell me. We've got so much, so much. Now, in the quest for individuality in this present contemporary moment of our history, culture, the, the current generation's uh, obsession with novelty. I mean, you know, folks just want to stand out, man, be recognized, be seen. Man, you want to be, sometimes it, it's better to be known for something notorious, something scandalous, rather than just to kind of go and fit in. This generation's obsession with individuality, novelty, I believe has caused us to lose the treasure of commonality. Yeah. We become a people who are triggered more easily by what is different between us. Those things we don't share in common rather than those things that hold us together. We are people who are easily able to pick out how we differ what we don't agree on. Rather than focus and mine and find our common ground. Most relationships fail not because we have too much in common, but rather because we find ourselves too different from one another. And, you know, I don't want to uncut my point too bad here. How many of you know, uh, sometimes when we fixate on what we have uh, in difference from one another, we, we, we lose the fact that most of the people we don't like are people who are most like us. All right, all right. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I, you know, folks, folks, got your, your style and you upset. Get your own style. <laughs> Folks, folks, we hating on Kobe because they feel like he's trying to be too much like Jordan. I'm like, well, who do you want him to be like? Jack Haley? Okay, well, you know who Jack Haley is, and that's my point. <laughs> be yourself. But how many of you know that sometimes it is the highest compliment for folks to try and emulate the best parts of our lives? Right. And in this regard, I continue to believe that our hyper obsession with trying to always think about our differences can hold you and I back from being in deep community with one another. I need to go further and ask, should we hold those things that are in common at a higher level of regard than those things which differentiate us. Who has taught us or conditioned us or influenced us that we should spend the majority of our limited time, because I know we all got limited time, that we should spend the limited time we have obsessing on that which makes us different. Now, I don't seem to trivialize the differences that we have because how many of you know there are many things pertaining to life, justice, salvation, other important things that are indeed different and distinct.
distinct. Just this past Friday, we've seen uh, one of the most significant rulings in this nation's history, Brown versus the Board of Education. Turned 60 years old. And certainly, uh, we all reap the benefits of that historic ruling. This idea that segregation by race was not a constitutional uh, concept, it was indeed something that needed to be remedied by a law. If you take a look back in the historical record, uh, for many of us, segregation seems to be this easy thing to ascertain and to reason, like why would anyone believe separate equals equal? Separate equals equal, <laughs> right? But in many regards, during that time, there were lots of reasonable people who believed that separate and equal was a just way to structure our society. There were Christians back then who believed there was nothing wrong with the way the world was. This was the way they thought it should be. And I find that when you look at the way folks argue over stuff today, we have not learned much from our history. I mean, those folks argue over things that if you, amen, just let time run its course, that thing will work itself out, and you don't got to fall out with folks over stuff, then after a while, you won't even remember what you was arguing about. Yeah. I wish I had a church in here today. Yeah. Amen. Some of us arguing over a man and a woman that you don't even like. It's just a principle. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But, but, but how many of you know that, that, that sometimes, uh, even in the midst of that which is different or we disagree about, reasonable people will have a different outlook on the same thing. Yeah. It's amazing to me how folks can disagree on matters of such importance, life or death type matters. I was being interviewed by a journalist for The Root, uh, is uh, MSNBC type thing, people, and they were asking me, why do I think Christians disagree on such issues like race and abortion and gay marriage and guns and the economy and war? Uh, you know, Rev, y'all read the same book. <laughs> I said, some of us do. <laughs> but I told him, we should not be surprised that folks disagree because all of us are deeply informed and shaped by our experiences. People that we are in relationship with. Our worldviews, sometimes the religious upbringing you've had or not had. Uh, time is long past. I don't even know if it was really there. But what the preacher said, everybody agreed with. Given the way some of what these preachers saying today, some of us thank God for that, amen? amen. <laughs> that, that in many respects, uh, we are a people who have differences because we have been shaped differently in the world. And yet we still share in common the same soil of human oppression and racial terror that has grounded us in fear and trauma. That has penetrated our souls and the most sacred parts of our being. I was deeply moved and uh, thankful, quite frankly, for this news report that came out uh, earlier this week that talked about how young people living in East and West Oakland and other neighborhoods all across the country, as much as 30%, are all easily diagnosable as post traumatic stress disorder young people. Because of the levels of violence and trauma and pain and death that people have had to endure. And how many of you know young people eventually grow up to be adults? And if you don't get that trauma addressed, hurting people will hurt other people. And how many of you know you're doing it not even know you're doing it? Because it's just inside the of you. We all in this country are drinking from the same well of brokenness, isolation, and fragmentation. And we are a people who are easily impacted by the hardship of life. And this is why I love Jesus 
response to folks in the scriptures, uh, particularly this one brother by the name of Nicodemus, a religious leader, sought Jesus out in the middle of the night, creeping, trying to do it over there, but not let anybody know that he's trying to figure out is this Jesus thing real? Jesus tells Nicodemus, you know, what you need to realize, Nicodemus, is you. Focus. 
focus on the next 40 days on holding what we have in common. You want to disagree with some folk, but how many of you know if you hold what you have in common, that may get you through your disagreement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Mm hmm, mm hmm. If you were focusing on two pages not being on the on the on the on the, the cap of the two pages not being on the two page toilet seat being left up, if you focusing on uh, how they play their music too loud in their cubicle, if you focusing on how you know they they always try to order what you order at the store or whatever, then you may not be able to be in common with them folks. <laughs> but if you remember, man, they human just like me. Yeah. They want love just like me. Yeah. They want to be safe just like me. They want to be safe. So then this text gives to you and I a very interesting and important kind of, 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 of example of what could happen when you and I live with what we have in common. Over the next six weeks, myself, Pastor Tay, Pastor Don, and a number of us will roll out more robustly what these common practices and beliefs and ways of worship uh, that we share together, how they can cause you and I to have a better connection to God and by extension one another. My hope is that through prayer and word and worship, through an active engagement in common practices and activities, disciplines that strengthen our spirit and our mind and our ability to love one another, you and I can be more powerfully aligned to bring into focus the big common goal of God. And if I could sum up the common goal, I would borrow the words of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer when he says, let your kingdom on earth be as it is in heaven. Right. How many of you would love to experience heaven right here on earth? Like, we all believe that baptism. 
Baptism is important. But you have folk who will disagree on how you should be baptized. Agree that we all should be baptized, but disagree on the uncommon form. Should I be immersed in the water, like held under the water until I'm half drowned? <laughs> and then come up coughing and gasping for air, talking about, yes, the spirit is moving. I'm just trying to live. <laughs> Like Jesus. 
you know? Because there's parts of me that need to be peeled. Okay. 
forgiver. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. If I have the word discipline, then I will become disciplined. Yes. But if you act like the devil, then guess what you're going to be? Yes. Somebody need to be healed under that water. Did <laughs> <laughs> that devil come out of the prison? <laughs> Give them a high five and tell them common actions, common actions. <laughs> And we'll spend some time in prayer here. Common beliefs should lead to common action, which then leads to common progress. Huh? Common progress. I cannot be well if you are not well. This radical individuality, I'm just gonna get mine, get rich back, trying. I hope you get yours. I hope you figure it out. That's not the Bible. That's American Western individualistic paganism. You'll never hear nobody preach about that. Go preach about everything else except for your greed, my selfishness, our idolatry. Amen. 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 That's why I say you be careful who you leave out of heaven. Amen. You better hope God don't leave no selfish folk out of heaven. You busting hell wide open. You better hope God don't leave no greedy folk out of heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. I know none of us feel like you're selfish or greedy. But let somebody ask you for a little bit of your money. I'm hard for this money. No, you want to get your own money. Get your own stuff. In the text, said that they sold everything that they had. I know. I don't even want to lie. like to read. Forty 
shit. So you can become what God would have you to be. This is what it means to be in community, brothers and sisters. And it ain't an easy thing. I got to tell you, some folk, I just wish they were not a part of my community. Not here, it's a wedding. I'm just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to go talk to folk about justice issues. I got to be reminded by the Holy Spirit that they are part of this community too. <laughs> I'm just, just burning inside. You want to pray that prayer, David? Lord, just crush my enemies' heads against the rocks. <laughs> Let their blood run down. <laughs> they want to get his prayers. <laughs> then the Holy Spirit got to remind me. Right, right. And you got something in common with these folks. So how do you share what you have in common? Wouldn't the hood look differently in West Oakland and North Oakland and South Berkeley and West Berkeley and Fillmore and Hunters Point and, and North Richmond and, and, and the, the Crescents and all. If everybody really realized that we got something in common. Yeah. I'm going to close with one great quote. One of the uh, Stanley Harawas at Duke, he said this quote, or he borrowed this quote, he said, he had a proposition for peace in the world if every Christian committed not to kill another Christian. <laughs> Just another Christian. I don't even talk about other folks. Don't you know you got Christians killing other Christians? In the name of the USA, in the name of the Bloods and the Creeks, in the name of the all. But if we just said, I'm not going to kill another follower of Jesus, we have peace in the world. What we have in common must override what we don't. It is only then that we become God's people. And he's destined us to be. Stand with me, everyone.